the Marxists say, well, that wasn't real Marxism. What it really means, and I've thought about this for a long time, it's the most arrogant possible statement anyone could ever make. It means, if I would have been in Stalin's position, I would have ushered in the damn utopia instead, instead of the genocidal massacres, because I understand the doctrine of Marxism and everything about me is good. It's like, well, think again, sunshine. You don't understand it. You don't understand it. And you're not that good. And if the power was in your hands, assuming you had the competence, which you don't, you wouldn't have done any better. And even if you had, there would have been someone else waiting right behind you to shoot you the first time you actually tried to do anything good. And that's what happened to all the old guard who ran the damn revolution. Stalin rounded them all up and shot them along with their families and millions of other people. So even if you do happen to be that avatar of moral purity that you claim implicitly, the probability that you'd get to act out your goodness in relationship to those possessed by your ideology is zero. Do you think a trans woman is a woman? No. Why not? Because I think that women are capable, generally speaking, of having babies, and they have female genitalia, and they have an XX chromosome, and, and I think the biological markers are relevant. The Ministry of Women's Affairs in New Zealand, and the Minister of Women's Affairs, or the Minister for Women, as she's known, suggested recently that there were too many white old men on boards in New Zealand of private and public companies and just suggested that they needed to move aside so there could be more diversity. Your response to that suggestion? Well, um, what, what's her racial and ethnic background, just out of curiosity? I, I think uh, she's born in America, Julianne Genta. Um, she's a member of our Green Party here. Is she white? Yes. Well, maybe it's time for her to bloody well move aside and let someone who isn't white have her position. That's pure narcissism at work, by the way. <laughs> to hijack an event like this that other people put time and effort into and to use the, their, their civility of the crowd and the civility of the organizers as an excuse to blatantly yell out your ill-informed opinions is no way to conduct a civil dialogue. It's absolutely appalling. The people who do that should be embarrassed. Why should your right to freedom of speech trump a trans person's right not to be offended? Because in order to be able to think, you have to risk being offensive. I mean, look at the conversation we're having right now. You know, like you're certainly willing to risk offending me in the pursuit of truth. Why should you have the right to do that? It's been rather uncomfortable. Well, I'm, I'm very glad I put you on the spot. <laughs> Well, I'm you get my, that but, I no, but you get my, my point. Speech. You get my point. It's like you're you're doing what you should do, which is digging a bit to see what the hell's going on, so and that you, is what you should do. But I you're exercising you think... your freedom of speech to certainly risk offending me, and that's fine. I think you, more power to you, as far as I'm concerned. So you haven't sat there, and I'm just trying. I'm just trying to work that out. I mean. Ha! Gotcha. You have got me. You have got me. I'm trying to work that through time. my head. In your video, you said that the problem with those angry women is that since at the end of the argument you cannot fight physically, you can't really deal with them. <laughs> that's not what I said. I said that that's one of the things that keeps conversation between men civil. Women can't argue with angry women. Women are often bullied by angry women. What I meant was more, uh, you, uh, you, you, you said that, and I'm really like not trying to paraphrase you or, you know, to put words into your mouth. Uh, you, you, you actually you said, you are trying that no, directly. No, it is things that you said, that you cannot deal with uh, those Yes, uh, but don't tell me that you're not trying to put they're words into my mouth because you've this. selected what you're going to ask, and you selected it very carefully with a tremendous amount of forethought. Well, I, no, and I, there's a purpose for that. What is the purpose precisely? I am, I am quoting things that you said. Why? 
Because, what is it that because, you're trying because, to establish? Because you said that. I'm I trying... thought we were talking about masculinity. We are. No, we're not. Yes, we are. What? How are we talking about masculinity? Because I'm asking you what you think of men and of women. Isn't no, basically that... what you've been trying to do, I would say, for the last 15 minutes is put me into a sequence of corners by accusing me of various forms of misbehavior. So the, why are we the, doing that? The, What's the point here? These are things that you said. Uh, my That's job my as a journalist is to ask questions about what you represent and the ideas that you defend. Your, your job is also to select the things that you might ask about in some manner that doesn't indicate a substantive bias. You picked three things to talk to me about in the last 20 minutes that were very carefully selected. Like, why did you pick those things? Because this is my job. No, not necessarily. You could be asking me, for example, why I've spoken to 250,000 people live in the last eight months. That might be more newsworthy. Well, we're not going to have a, a big debate about journalism, but uh, if a journalist doesn't ask the tough questions, how can you give the good answers? Well, it depends on what the tough questions are. It depends well, on the I didn't whether think that they would be tough. We're talking about things that you said. I mean, if it's easier to have conversation between men, because there is this underlying threat, you know, of a uh, physical uh, contact. I don't think it's you... easier. Mm. It tends to be somewhat more civil. One of the things that the postmodernists, postmodern neo-Marxists continually claim is that they have nothing but compassion for the downtrodden. And I would say that anybody with more than a cursory knowledge of 20th century history who dares to claim simultaneously that they have compassion for the downtrodden and that they're Marxists, are revealing either their an ignorance of history that's so astounding that it's actually a form of miracle or a kind of <laughs> or a kind of malevolence that's so reprehensible that it's almost unspeakable because we already ran the equity experiment over the course of the 20th century and we already know what the the marxist doctrines have done for oppressed people all around the world and the answer to that mostly was imprison them enslave them work them to death or execute them and as far as i can tell that's not precisely commensurate with any message of compassion and so i don't think that the postmodern neo marxists have a leg to stand on ethically or intellectually or emotionally or and i think that they should be gone after as hard as possible there's absolutely no excuse whatsoever in the 21st century to put forth Marxist doctrines. Sorry, tried that, didn't work. We got 100 million corpses to prove it, and that's plenty for me. And if it's not enough for you, well, then you should do some serious thinking either about your historical knowledge or about your moral character. I'm interested in people being able to have different choices and, um, and having equality of outcome. Aha, well, so the overwhelming proportion of people who are in prisons are male. Now, do you want to equalize that? just out of curiosity. I, what about bricklayers? They're 99% male. And, the, and we've got about three quarters of, of the population now in universities mm -hmm. in the humanities and social sciences are female. Yeah. Are we going to equalize that? And men, men work more longer hours. They work more dangerous jobs. They're more likely to move. They're more likely to work outside. They're more likely to participate in jobs in the STEM fields that are scalable. They make more money for those reasons. And that's all hidden under the idea that the reason that men and women make different amounts of money is because of their gender. It's a very simplistic analysis. Why are you against the use of alternate pronouns? I'm, not, I'm against the use of, of le legislation to determine what words are that myself and other people are required to utter. But would you use alternate pronouns if a student asked you to? I think I've made my position on that clear already. Well, perhaps not to our audience at home who are just being introduced to this. Would you use alternate no. pronouns? And why not? I, because I don't believe that other people have the right to determine what language I use, especially when it's backed by punitive legislation. And when the words that are being required are the constructions, they're artificial constructions of people I regard as radical ideologues whose viewpoint I do not share. I'm talking about compelled speech. There's a difference between saying that there's something you can't say and saying that there are things that you have to say. And I regard these made-up pronouns, all of them, as the neologisms of radical PC authoritarians. Do you understand that? And I don't, I'm not a fan of that sort of person. And the reason I'm not a fan of that sort of person is because I've done my homework. I've read everything I can get my hands on in the development of authoritarian political systems, and I know the literature inside out and backwards. And I am not going to be a mouthpiece for language that I detest. And that's that. Why do you think it is that so much of what you 
say is so very popular with the alt-right? It isn't. And you don't have any evidence for that at all? Uh, well, any I'm, more than the I'm, evidence that alt-right people Dave watch Storm this show? Neonite yeah, website, Savior of Western Civilization. On. Oh, well, there was, that was all taken apart today by a number of Jewish publications, by the way, showing that, first of all, that was all satirical commentary on the part of the alt-right, directed at taking me down, for example. And there was an alt-right article yesterday published t saying that I was a Jewish stooge and shill. So well, this is absolute nonsense, and I don't, uh, I, I don't appeal primarily to the alt-right. There's no evidence for that at all. It's the, it's the no, proclivity I said, of... I never said, pr pr I never said primarily, um, yeah. Jordan. What I'm interested in is why you think that you get the reaction that you do from the alt-right, looking at, you know, the Cathy Newman documentary... Uh, what doc reaction? Get into ...interview. There's 10 there million people lot, watched that awful, and commented awful, on it. I'm, I'm talking about what I saw, mm. and I'm curious to know what your reaction was to the, to the, to the glee with which the alt-right seized upon uh, that well, interview. I don't shall accept we, the... Shall we do with the death threats? I mean, she had, yeah, I think, a dozen I don't accept the threats. concept that it was the alt-right that was doing this. There were 10 million people who commented on that video, and about 95% of them commented negatively on Kathy Newman's behavior. You think there's 10 million alt-right trolls watching that? We are challenging inequality. We are challenging the refusal to see me as an individual. When we overcome that, have at it, we're all on equal no, plane. Okay. So, like, no, I think it's good. I think it's good. Good. This this good. The body is getting stirred here. So, I've okay. got a couple of questions. So, so let's, let's, your side spoke, so I'm going to go yeah. to Jordan, then to you, Let's Michelle. assume for a moment that I've benefited from my white privilege. Okay, so let's assume that. That's, that's fine. Assumption. That's Yeah, well, assumption. that's what you would say. So, um... Um, so let's say, mm. here, let's get precise mm. about this, okay? Was that in very individual of you? <laughs> let's get precise about this, mm -hmm. okay? Let's get precise. To what degree is my pre present level of attainment or achievement a consequence of my white privilege? And I don't mean sort of. I mean, do you mean 5%? Do you mean 15%? Do you mean 25%? Do you mean 75%? And what do you propose I do about it? How about a tax? How about a tax that's like specialized for me so that I can account for my damn privilege you so that I can stop right hearing right. about it? Now, let's get precise about one other thing, okay? We'll get precise about one other thing. Now, precise? Yeah, precise, preci yes. Mm. And so, if, if we can agree, and we haven't, that the left can go too far, which it clearly can, mm. then how would my worthy opponents precisely define when the left that they stand for has gone too far. You didn't like equity, equality of outcome, I think that's a great marker, but if you have a better suggestion and, and won't sidestep the question, so let's figure out how I can dispense with my white privilege and so that you can tell me when the left has gone too far, since they clearly can. And that's what this debate is about, about political correctness. It's about the left going too far. And I think it's gone too far in many ways. And I'd like to figure out exactly how and when so the reasonable left could make its ascendance again and we could quit all this nonsense. You may not realize it, but you are currently funding some dangerous people. They are indoctrinating young minds throughout the West with their resentment-ridden ideology. They have made it their life's mission to undermine Western civilization itself, which they regard as corrupt, oppressive, and patriarchal. If you're a taxpayer, or paying for your kid's liberal arts degree, you're underwriting this gang of nihilists. You're supporting ideologues who claim that all truth is subjective, that all sex differences are socially constructed, and that Western imperialism is the sole source of all third world problems. They are the postmodernists, pushing progressive activism at a college near you. They produce the mobs that violently shut down campus speakers, the language police who enshrine into law use of fabricated gender pronouns, and the deans whose livelihoods depend on madly rooting out discrimination where little or none exists. Their thinking took hold in Western universities in the 60s and 70s when the true believers of the radical left became the professors of today. And now we rack up education-related debt, not so that our children learn to think critically, write clearly, or speak properly, but so they can model their mentor's destructive agenda. It's now possible to complete an English degree and never encounter Shakespeare, one of those dead white males whose works underlie our society of oppression. To understand and oppose the postmodernists, the ideas by which they orient themselves must be clearly identified. First is their new unholy trinity of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Diversity is defined not by opinion, but by race, ethnicity, or sexual identity. 
equity is no longer the laudable goal of equality of opportunity, but the insistence on equality of outcome. And inclusion is the use of identity-based quotas to attain this misconceived state of equity. All the classic rights of the West are to be considered secondary to these new values. Take, for example, freedom of speech, the very pillar of democracy. The postmodernists refuse to believe that people of goodwill can exchange ideas and reach consensus. Their world is instead a Hobbesian nightmare of identity groups warring for power. They don't see ideas that run contrary to their ideology as simply incorrect. They see them as integral to the oppressive system they wish to supplant and consider it a moral obligation to stifle and constrain their expression. Second is rejection of the free market, of the very idea that free voluntary trading benefits everyone. They won't acknowledge that capitalism has lifted up hundreds of millions of people so they can, for the first time in history, afford food, shelter, clothing, transportation, even entertainment and travel. Those classified as poor in the U.S. and increasingly everywhere else are able to meet their basic needs. Meanwhile, in once prosperous Venezuela, until recently the poster child of the campus radicals, the middle class lines up for toilet paper. Third and finally are the politics of identity. Postmodernists don't believe in individuals. You're an exemplar of your race, sex, or sexual preference. You're also either a victim or an oppressor. No wrong can be done by anyone in the former group, and no good by the latter. Such ideas of victimization do nothing but justify the use of power and engender intergroup conflict. All these concepts originated with Karl Marx, the 19th century German philosopher. Marx viewed the world as a gigantic class struggle, the bourgeoisie against the proletariat, the grasping rich against the desperate poor. But wherever his ideas were put into practice, in the Soviet Union, China, Vietnam, and Cambodia, to name just a few, whole economies failed and tens of millions were killed. We fought a decades-long Cold War to stop the spread of those murderous notions. But they're back in the new guise of identity politics. The corrupt ideas of the postmodern neo-Marxists should be consigned to the dustbin of history. Instead, we underwrite their continuance in the very institutions where the central ideas of the West should be transmitted across the generations. Unless we stop, postmodernism will do to America and the entire Western world what it's already done to its universities. I just read a paper that said that mathematics is whiteness. I didn't know that <laughs> mathematics could have a race. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, the, thing, yeah. the thing is, there's nothing illogical about these claims once you accept the central axioms. The axioms are straightforward. The world is a battleground of power hierarchies. That's what it is. There isn't anything else outside of that. And each power hierarchy generates its own internal narrative, including rules for what constitutes evidence, that support and buttress the structure of that hierarchy. And because the hierarchies exclude, then it's in the best interests of the people who are excluded to invert the hierarchy. And of course, they also regard that as just, even though that's part of the incoherence of the entire argument. That's where they have to turn to, to Marxism. But make no mistake about it. This isn't, this isn't accidental. It isn't people misunderstanding what constitutes evidence. Not at all. So when you and say Sam Harris argue about religion, you're arguing about fundamentally different things, it sounds like. His conception of what is religious is very different from yours. Yeah, well, he <laughs> tends to think of religious, religious thought the same way that a smart 13-year-old atheist thinks about a fundamentalist Christian. It's like, yeah, okay. That just, you're just not getting to the heart of the matter. You know, and I just finished reading all of Sam's books in the last couple of weeks. And as far as I'm concerned, he doesn't ever get to the bottom of the issue. He doesn't address the fundamental thinkers. There are some profound thinkers. Dostoevsky's one, Tolstoy, Nietzsche, Jung, it's like they're completely absent from, and the same with Dawkins, it's completely absent. All that conceptualization is completely absent from their corpus of works. They don't even have an understanding for the psychological utility of religion. And it's a big problem. You know, you, you don't get to be an atheist when the people you attack are fundament, like, like naive fundamentalists. And I have some, some sympathy for the naive fundamentalists. It's like what they're basically saying is something like this. 
look, we have an ethos that's valuable. You scientist types are casually dismantling it. What the hell are we supposed to do? Well, the fundamentalists don't know what to do about that, so they say, well, creationism is science. It's like, well, no, it's not. But that doesn't mean that they don't have a point. Their point is there's something valuable here. It's like, don't break it casually. What are you going to replace it with? The new atheists wish, wish that everybody becomes rational. It's like, yeah, sure, that's going to happen. I think more how we raise them, uh, how we live, uh, education, a sort of uh, culture, attitudes form a human being, uh, whether or not uh, they are uh, a girl or a boy when they grow up. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I raise my daughter to become a leader, to uh, be self-confident, to have a high education, for instance, I think she will have a good platform to become a civil engineer, to become a CEO of a company, or to become a nurse. Well, that, that, is what, that is what people who think that the differences between people who are primarily culturally constructed believe, but it's not what the evidence suggests. Okay. You've talked a lot in defense of traditional hierarchies, both of gender, of class, so on, uh, though emphatically not of race. Uh, and so it seems that I haven't talked about defensive traditional hierarchies in terms of gender and class. That's not true. Well, you've talked about hierarchies in society. You've talked yeah, about the, that's yes. true. I well, have done that, not but that I haven't justified them on the basis of gender and class. You, or, you or whatever it well, okay, you, you talk not about, okay. That's an important yes, distinction. Okay, but you, you defend hierarchies in society in a way that you talk a lot about the Pareto distribution. Yes. That doesn't mean I yeah. defend it. Well, okay. You, you, no, not well, yes. okay. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, I think you talk Observing a lot. Observing that something exists is yes. not the same as defending it. How in the world? Well, people attack it, right? What's that? And you don't. People attack it. Attack as inherently what? Attack the hierarchies of society as inherently unjust, right? Well, they are, they're unjust, but yes. they're also useful. Okay, so you, you, def you say they're useful. Some well, look, people look, look at it this way. Okay, look at it this way. <laughs> You obviously think that it's worthwhile to stand up and ask a question. Yes. So you think that standing up and asking a question is better than yes. not standing up and asking a question. Yes. Okay, that's a hierarchy. Yes. Of values. Yes. Okay, without the hierarchy of values, you couldn't act. Of course. No, no, not of course. Well, wait. It's you, partly why I'm I, defending I the hierarchy. Here. Without no a hierarchy, there's no the impetus to act. Hierarchy, right? What's that? There is a hierarchy in society, right? No, there's multiple hierarchies okay, there are in multiple society. hierarchies in society, right? Yes. And you say that they are based in, you, you invoke the lobster, right? That they are based in, uh, in nature. Yes. I said that they were inevitable. Yes, yes. that they were inevitable. Some right. people that disagree with that. doesn't mean that they're but, good. But my point is that, uh, this is generally relevant to it, you have a broader point than free speech. This is one of the things you talk about, yes? Yes. Okay. Whereas I think there are some other activists who focus on more exclusively I'm not on an free activist. Speech. I want to talk about oppression for a moment, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I'm going to play a little clip here from, from one of your lectures so that we are really grounded in what you said. You're oppressed, you're oppressed, you're oppressed, you're oppressed. God only knows why. Maybe you're too short or you're not as beautiful as you could be. Or, you know, your parent, your grandparent was a serf, likely, because almost everybody's grand, great grandparent was. It's like, you know, and you're not as smart as you could be. And, you have a sick relative, and you have your own physical problems, and it's like, frankly, you're a mess. And you're oppressed in every possible way, including your ancestry and your biology. And the entire sum of human history has conspired to produce victimized you with all your individual pathological problems. It's like, yes, true. Do you ever worry that, that saying something like that might create a false equivalency? between different kinds of oppression? No, no, because I'm not willing to view the world through the oppression identity politics lens. And I, I think the fact that we do that virtually reflexively now is extraordinarily dangerous. You know, and, and even if there are ethnic differences in historical oppression on some timescales, which is undoubtedly true, that doesn't mean that we divide people into tribes now and we assign blame for those historical inequities. All it'll do is tribalize us, and you can see that happening like mad in the West and in Europe right now. It's very dangerous. I grew up in Toronto, and I'm just speaking from the perspective of someone who, who experienced, you know, like sort of systemic racial prejudice everywhere I went. You know, that's, that's my framework. I, I don't know if it's neo-Marxism or postmodernism, or if it's just 
my reality? I mean, there is obviously there's there's arbitrary um, obstacles standing in people's way. Some of those have to do with gender. Some of them have to do with race and prejudice and bias and all that. But the landscape around us with regards to those things is improving very rapidly. It's much better than it has been in the past. And I still think that the proper way to construe the situation is to look to yourself as an individual. The fact that there are still places where prejudice is a problem is is self-evident. People are tribal by nature, but we don't contend with it by turning to an identity politics view of the world. It's not going to help. And I see Trudeau doing that all the time, to return to your initial question. I don't think he has any idea what sort of fire he's playing with. When I see that tweet from Justin Trudeau, I see a guy who's saying like, hey, it's great to see all these women out in solidarity supporting equal rights for women. And, and str- He wasn't supporting equal rights. He was supporting equality of outcome. And he was the same person who formulated his cabinet, it was one of his first first acts as leader to ensure that his cabinet was 50% women and 50% men, despite the fact that only 25% of the elect people were women. He selected his cabinet on the basis of their genitalia. And this is all under the influence, you say, of postmodernism and neo-Marxism. neo-Marxism. Yeah, But well, aren't those things two separate things? They're completely separate. Mm. You know, and this is something I've been criticized for. Dr. Peterson doesn't understand the difference between neo-Marxism and, and, and postmodernism. It's like, I understand the difference perfectly well. It isn't me that's conflating them. It turns out that the people who push postmodern doctrines in the university almost al- always ally themselves with a Marxist viewpoint. Mm-hmm. And that is logically incoherent. But I would say the postmodernists really don't give a damn for logical coherence because they regard that as part of the oppressive, patriarchal, Eurocentric view of the world. The idea that there's an objective reality and all of that and that you can deal with it with logic talk about you know feminizing men it almost sounds derogatory it's almost as if you're saying that to be feminine or to express any sort of femininity is actually inferior to masculinity Um, and I think that is a huge problem even with within the language that we use you know when you say don't be such a girl don't be such a pussy the the greatest insults that men can give each other tend to have feminine or origins like you know as I said pussy or faggot um, or anything like that and I think again that speaks to um a very systematic um, inequality uh, between the genders. Um, and, yeah, and you attributed the, the, the uh, rates of mental illness among men to their inability to express, say, sentimental emotions. Well, and I don't think there's a shred of clinical evidence to support what, that stance. I, sorry. Um, no, go ahead. no, no, no. no. What, what, well, you know, I don't think there's a shred of evidence I mean, to support that stance. The kind of violence, for example, that I, Lawrence is discussing is a consequence of competitive um, Competitive violence a young, among young men. Is, I, think as is, I think there is some evidence that men find yes. it difficult to talk about things, and that that um, and they also ways in which you can help young men to they, talk about they, things. They, and that's the evidence for yeah. the differential rates of, of mental health and suffering. I, also, I don't I think know, so. I also don't think I, um, when you're talking about things being so innate. Um, you know, I mean, Judith Butler would have said that, you know, gender is a construct, that gender is a performance. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and Judith if you Butler look, doesn't know what she's talking about in the least, so well, I don't accept that. I mean, that's that interesting, a, a, but I, I, she's I, no I scientist, agree with She her. doesn't know the well, psychological then if you look at someone literature. Like you accept this oppression narrative without question. You know, a hundred and twenty I don't. Years ago, I don't accept anything without question. I'm just telling you a fact. That's not a fact. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Women were women were expected to stay home and take care of the kids and cook a meal. That's a f- women didn't have reliable birth control until 1960. You know, don't you think that played a role? Don't you think the fact that they they didn't have reliable care for their are you their blaming women for not being they, allowed to lead countries to lead nations because they didn't? They were have- allowed to lead nations. There were queens in many countries. I think you have no idea how much this oppression narrative has saturated your thinking. Do you want a more a state with more regulatory power? Do you want a state with more surveillance? I mean, first of all, why would you think that that would be trustworthy when all the evidence suggests in the past that as a state expands its surveillance power, it actually becomes less trustworthy rather than more? And why would you want, you might think, well, I certainly want someone looking into your affairs, but I don't want anybody looking into mine. Well, good luck with that, because, you know, to the degree that I have someone, elect someone to look into your affairs, they're bloody well going to be looking into mine as well. And that just doesn't strike me as a particularly positive development. And, uh, practically, because I don't believe it'll work. I don't think surveillance states do make people more honest. I think all the evidence is 
the opposite. And then I would say from the individual perspective, it's like I believe that the, the fundamental, what we got fundamentally right in the West, because there is a number of things we got fundamentally right, even though we don't like to admit that anymore, is that the ultimate moral responsibility for the state relies on you. It relies on your moral integrity. And, you know, you can, it's not that hard to think that through. It's like, well, first of all, you have the right and the responsibility to vote. And we could say, well, that's not exactly given to you by the state. It's, it's something that exists in some, in some sense outside and before the state. It's part and parcel of your intrinsic value. Okay, so that's a decision that we've made in the West, that each person, regardless of their flaws, is characterized by a value, an intrinsic value, that's so deep and so profound that the very uh, regulation of the state itself rests on their shoulders. And that's really something. That's, that's why you have the right to vote. And that's worth thinking about. The, the first question is, well, do you think that's a good idea or not? Like, do you believe that we are, in fact, sovereign individuals? And then, well, let's assume that you believe that we are, because the alternative is some sort of autocracy, right? It's some sort of tyranny. It's, it's, the, it's the parsing off of that sovereignty to a bureaucracy or to some arbitrary form of leadership. And maybe you can believe in that, and you'd like a strong leader, and fine. But you, you want to think that through. Because if, if it's not that, then it's you. Well, then it's, if it's you, and you have to make sure that the ship of state is sailing properly, then the first thing you might want to ask yourself is, what makes you think you're any more trustworthy than the people that you're, that you're despising or criticizing? I mean, if, if you are, well, more power to you. But it isn't self-evident that you are, and my suspicions are that it's not even self-evident to you that you are. Because it's a very rare person that you come across, if you talk to them with any degree of seriousness, you know, they're able to lay out a, a whole litany of, of ways they fall short of their own value, their own values, not values that other people are putting on them, certainly that as well, and they can name innumerable ways that not only are they not doing what they should be doing, so they're falling short of the mark in that way, but they're doing all sorts of things that they definitely shouldn't be doing, and they know it. It's like, well, are we going to put that right or not? And my sense is, you know, I wrote a rule in my book, put your house in perfect order before you complain about the world, before you criticize the world. Well, what's the idea? It's like, well, you're the sovereign, man. If the, states, if the ship of state is listing and sinking, that's you. That's your problem. It's your fault. You're not doing it right. You're not educated enough. You're not awake enough. You're not articulated enough. Articulate enough. You don't know enough about history. You're not taking on enough responsibility. You're looking for other people to blame because it's convenient. And, and, and that's kind of understandable because it's the dispersal of responsibility. Who wants all that responsibility? But there's a huge price to be paid for it. The, the first price that you pay for it is, well, there goes the adventure of your life. It's like you could get yourself together and be the bedrock of the state, right? That'd be hard. That'd call on everything that you have. That would be your adventure. You're going to pass that off to someone else? And then, then what do you do? You've got nothing left in your life but triviality. And you can't live. I don't believe that people can live ethically, trivially. That's why I think the pursuit of the idea that life is for happiness is wrong. Because life is too difficult for that to be the case. Our lives are too profound, too characterized by suffering and malevolence. The world is too characterized by trouble at every level for happiness to be the proper solution. The, re the solution is something like a heavy burden of ethical responsibility. The, the kind that sets the state straight. And then in that, you find the purpose of your life. And so not only if you want the external monitoring and the surveillance state, not only do you sacrifice your privacy and invite all that invasive attention and lose your impulsive freedom, 
You lose everything that's profound about your life, and someone takes it from you. They take your destiny from you. And that's no way to live. That's just, that's the tyranny that we've struggled against in the West successfully for, I would say, in one way or another for, for, for a number of thousands of years, and with a substantial amount of success. This kind of protest is an expression of a philosophy that's grounded partly in postmodernism and partly in Marxism. Now, the postmodern element is basically this. There's no such thing as genuine individual identity. What there is is group identity. And you, like it or not, only have the interests of your group. And the whole world is nothing but a battleground between groups of different interests. There's no dialogue. There's no possibility of talking between the groups. It's just a power stage where combat has to take place. And so the reason that speakers with whom the radical postmodernists and the Marxists don't agree are denied a platform is because those people do not believe from a philosophical position that dialogue can bring consensus. And all that's left, if you forego that particular principle, is this. And this is only where it starts. You know, the fact is, is that you're all pretty damn civilized. And thank God for that. Because if there were enough fools in the crowd, especially those who are intent on violence, this would turn out very differently. Right. And we do not want to go down that pathway. It's a big mistake. We've been down that pathway many, many times. And in classes where people push doctrines on you, get your damn arguments together and push back. You know, but you have to be more articulate and more well-read and more better educated than the people against whom you're pushing. But that's your job at the university. And there's nothing more powerful than someone who is articulate. And no one ever says that to you. It's true. If you, if you go in the library and read great people, write so that you learn how to think and talk so that you learn how to speak, it'll make you unbelievably powerful. And that's what university is for. And I can't understand why you're not told that. <laughs> nothing more powerful than articulate speech. Nothing.